Chapter two, American experiments, 1521 to 1700s. So in this chapter, we're talking about colonization of this new world. So chapter one explained to us who the three cultures were as America developed that collided into each other at the time of European contact and exploration. And these three peoples, the Europeans, the Africans, and the uh, Native Americans, their interactions and contributions will continue throughout American history, even to this present day. So chapter two is about the early attempts at colonization. So what is a colony? What does colonization mean? It's the action or process of settling among and establishing control over the indigenous people of an area. Also appropriating a place or domain for one's typically a country's own use. So understand it's not a friendly visit. You're 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 looking for a place to to uh, exploit. You want to get get the raw goods that it has to offer for your own country. You want to you want to take advantage of the indigenous people that were there as a source of labor. So you come to a colony, and you want to get the goods that it has, whether it be timber, fur, crops, uh, cotton, gold, whatever it might be. You want to get the, get that get those raw resources from the land ship them back to your mother country where they can manufacture them to make money. Uh, in, in, in the process of doing so, you establish control over the indigenous people of, of an area and you enslave them, put them, into, put them to work. So understand a colony is not a friendly thing. It, it, colonization, colonialism is a, is a, is a term that is, that is uh, you know, it, it, it uh, suggests oppression, okay? <clears throat> So you talk about this is where slavery comes comes uh, rises in America, chattel slavery. What is chattel? A person who has the legal status of property can be bought and sold. So you're you're like a, a wagon or a pitchfork. You know you're just a piece of property, like a like a you sell your car and you sign over the pink slip. A person has a pink slip. You're you're a piece of property that can be bought and sold any any way that you'd like. Okay, so coming to the new world. Of course, we're talking the English colonies here. The colonists that came, you, you have a you have a slew of challenges. You've got to survive. You've got to be protection from the weather, from the natives. You've got to find a water source. You've got to grow food to survive the winter. All these challenges. So, so one challenge, as your community develops, you're going to have laws. One challenge you're not going to worry about is the law. Just simply bring English law with you. Whatever English, whatever law is in English, can be the same here. But in this situation here, there is one law that they actually change. It's interesting. Why would they change a law? It's complicated to do that. Why do that? So the law is all children born in this country shall be held in bondage or free only according to the condition of the mother. The little sidebar uh, tutorial on, on writing here real quick. Okay, When you're, when you're reading scholarship, and, and, and that means it's based on other people's research for the most part, and the author is building a new argument upon the research of others. Uh, when you come across uh, SIC in brackets, that doesn't mean this is sick, dude. It doesn't mean that, okay? SIC, SIC is, is a Latin uh, word, and it means just as, or that's really how it appears in the original. So as, as the writer, when I see the word shall be spelled like that, that's not the way we spell it today. It's it's incorrectly spelled. The, the truth is it may be correctly spelled for that day, but we don't spell it that way now. So I put S-I-C meaning that, yes, I'm aware that shall be is misspelled. That's how it appeared in the original. So that's what S-I-C means. And then further down the next line, you see that in bondage is in brackets. So I've added that also. If I didn't add that, the quote would say, all children born in this country shall be held or free only according to the condition of the mother. Um, we don't know what held or free means in, in, in our modern day, okay? Uh, in, in those days, they did. If a person was held, they were slaves. So I added in bondage to make it clear to the modern reader what, what held means, okay? Okay, so getting back to... Uh, this this uh, law. So the idea of following the condition of the mother ran contrary to patriarchal English law, where a child's status was always derived from the father. It's a male-dominated society. Europe was male-dominated, patriarchal. Uh, 
there would be no, there would never be a question about about a child's bloodline. It would go to the father. <clears throat> the, the mother was was you know on some levels insignificant when it came to these types of things. Uh, so it's very unusual in the Americas. They change it. They change it to the to the mother. Unusual people have changed a lot like that when it had been used for so many years. So why did they do that? It's complicated to change laws. What about being in America made them change this law? Why change from the father to the mother? <clears throat> if we could go back in time and, and visit a plantation of the South in the 17th, 18th centuries, and if you, in a large plantation with 100 slaves, as you walk around the, the plantation, you'd see that many slaves were mixed race, lighter skin. Where where did they come from? Um, and this is a practice in the South, the, the plantation owners or their sons or other male family members would procreate with their female slaves to create other slaves, slaves for free. So I'm, I'm using the word procreate as a nice term to, to mean what I really mean is rape, because that's what it was. And it was perfectly legal to do. Uh, slaves were property, had no rights. They were chattel. You could do with them whatever you wanted to. So if you wanted to beat one, uh, whip one, rape one, or murder one. If you if you literally walked your slave to the sheriff's office and killed the, your slave right in front of the sheriff, the sheriff wouldn't arrest you because it's your property. They don't have the rights of a human being. They don't have any rights at all. Okay, so um, so a a man could do whatever he wanted to. So of course, if you're a a woman on a plantation, try try to imagine your daily life. You get up, you go to the fields. But at any moment, you could be taken by a man at, at you know against your will. You, you you can't really stop it. You you can't say no. You can't call for help. You can't call the police because it's perfectly okay to do with you what the man wants to. Um, so I want you to watch a a, a a a film here, and it's a very short film. It's called Enslaved African Rape Scene. So this is very unsettling. And, um, you know, I, I actually kind of pondered whether to show this or not. It's, it's not that it's so graphic, but, but it's, it's unsettling for what you see. It's, it's pretty violent and, and frightening. And, and yes, it's a Hollywood movie. Uh, you'll, you'll recognize Mariah Carey as the slave woman. This comes from the 2013 movie called The Butler. Uh, but it's an example of a lot of things, this idea of a of a man being able to take a woman whenever he wants and she can't stop him. So you see her reaction, she can't say no, but she's got to go. But you also see her husband, a black man, a slave man, he can't stop him either. He's emasculated. What's, what does emasculated mean? I mean you know, it's, it's, it's in a man's nature, especially in our culture. We were brought up to protect women our mothers, our sisters, our wives, whoever, um, we, we, we step in and we protect a woman. But in, 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 uh, in the slave fields, in the plantations, a man couldn't because he might, might be killed. Uh, so he, of course, can't stop his wife from being taken away to be raped. Uh, he's helpless. But then their little son, who hasn't learned the ways of the plantation yet, He's what's going on? And he's he's calling to his mom, mom, don't go. And but but she says it's okay, don't worry about it. He turns to his dad, you what are you gonna do? Do something. And of course the man can't do anything. So you have all this all this kind of psychological intricacy going on here. You also have the slave master who's taking the woman. <laughs> what kind of man is he? I mean, he's a you know, he's a he's a vile creature. He he doesn't care about anybody but himself. He's uh, probably lives a life of debauchery and, and, you know, grabbing a woman when he wants it is, is part of his daily routine. But you also see not, not quite in the, in the same uh, scene with what happening in this field, but, but, you know, across the way, you see the white woman of the, of the big house. She comes outside, she hears the screams, and she realizes that, you know, a woman is being taken by it might be her son, it might be her husband, and you see her pain because how, how does how does a white woman deal with her husband or sons doing this, you know, um, uh, consistently? And, and how does a how does a wife deal with mixed race slaves running around the plantation that look like her husband? 
uh, okay, so go ahead and watch the watch the film um, and then come on back. Okay, so this is this is not pretty, um, but but understand it's part of the story. You know, I told you in the start here, we, I'm not going to leave anything unturned telling you the truth. This is this is part of the truth of the South. For sex was one way to create more slaves that you didn't have to pay for because they were expensive. But make no mistake about it, it was also for the pleasure of the man doing it. In those days, especially in the South, the South Southern men especially lived with the code of honor. And they saw their wives as virtuous and pious and, and above them, spiritual, and they put them on pedestals. Um, and they saw them as too pure, too dirty with sexual advances. So, so a man would only go to his wife when you wanted to have children, uh, not for sexual pleasure. So because you wouldn't want to take away her, her virtuosity. You want to leave her up there on the pedestal. So, that, so a man would, would take his, his sexual desires to the slave shacks. And, and, and there, of course, there was nobody stopping him from doing whatever he wanted to do. Now, so again, I'm, I'm talking to generalities here. I'm not suggesting that every slave owner did this, that every plantation did it, but probably more than not, because how else do you account for all the mixed race slaves that were running around these plantations, okay? Um, so in general, female slaves were encouraged to have babies, and, and they were okay with that because if they were pregnant, they, they might get out of the fields. Not, not always. You, you've heard of, perhaps you've heard of the slave woman working away, and she stops for a minute, births her baby, puts it on her, on her back, and keeps on working. <clears throat> um, you know, that, there were instances of that, too. But for the most part, if a woman was eight, nine months pregnant, she was taken out of the fields and allowed to relax until the baby was born, maybe for a month after the baby was born. So, so female slaves wanted to be pregnant, um, but understand, they didn't want to be raped, okay? But the condition of being pregnant got them out of the fields. Um, okay, so, so by creating a law that said the, the condition of a child followed the condition of the mother, in other words, if your mother was a slave, so were you. If your mother was black, so were you. So how did they define black in those days? So in those days, if you had one drop of black blood, you were black. Even though the person appeared to be white, it really didn't matter. Um, if it could be proven that your grandmother was a black woman, but you looked white, you were black. If you're black, you're a slave. So that person would be taken taken off and sold somewhere to go work in the fields. Okay, uh, this is the way it was then. It was a very brutal uh, place. The 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 South of you know pre Civil War South, post Civil War South too. Um, that's a different story though. Um, this idea of one drop uh, is it was a big deal. So please watch two short films back to back. Please watch the film uh, called I Am Human: One Drop Rule. And then watch the film entitled Holly Berry, Custody Battle Reopens One Drop Rule Debate. And, and here you see a, a, a modern day celebrity that doesn't know her history. And she brings up the one drop rule, uh, you know, as a, as a way to define her daughter. And she doesn't realize that she's dredging up a, a kind of an ugly and painful past. If you're a black person today, you don't condone the one drop rule. Uh, so go ahead and watch those two films. Okay, so by changing this old English law, it made it easier for the white man responsible to ignore or turn his back on his own child. If his child had black blood, and of course they did because the mother was black, a slave woman, then they were property. They had no rights. They were also considered to be inferior, even though it was the man's child. So this, by changing this law from the father to the mother, it allowed a white man to justify turning his back on his own offspring. Uh, and this, of course, is easier to do if the law saw them as inferior or subservient to you. So the children of slave women were forever considered to be slaves themselves. And this is the realities of the old South and the plantation system, okay? It's not, it, it's, it, it wasn't all gone with the wind. This is an, a, a pretty ugly, treacherous life for these people. Okay, let's let's move move toward these different types of colonies. So tribute colonies is the first one. Um, 
uh, collecting goods from conquered people. So you conquer a place and you take their stuff, okay? Tribute colonies don't relate to the United States, what would become the United States um, uh, very much, and in fact, not at all, but they are part of the story of the New World. Tribute colonies were, 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 were the Spanish were, Mexico and South America. The next two, plantation and neo-European, do, do relate to what happens in the United States. The plantation, largely agricultural, to fill the demands of certain crops, use slave labor. Neo-European, neo meaning new, uh, were modeled after Euro European traditions. They copied their patterns of economic and social organization. They wanted to duplicate a society that resembled the one that they had left. So, of course, you, you come to a new place. Again, all those challenges, you're not going to you know, re rewrite the architecture book or you're gonna you're gonna build a, a community that looks like the one you, that you came from. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about tribute first. So so tribute colonies, um, mostly Spain, uh, and in the mid 1500s, tribute colonies resulted from the Spanish conquering Mexico and Peru. So the conquerors received what was what was called encomienda from their king, from their monarch. So what is encomienda? It literally means to entrust. A grant of Indian labor given by Spanish kings to prominent men. So prominent men, a conquistador, a leader of the conquistadors, the king who's never been to this land in his life and probably never will be, he gives you a big piece of land uh, that, that's now yours for you know a job well done. You, you, you help to conquer these people and this is your land, okay? Uh, so, it, so encomienda uh, means that what, whatever, whatever land you got, it, it was usually a large, vast grant of land, but, but that grant of land included any cities or natives or towns or communities or families that lived there now became yours. So you see the, the, the images here on the left, you see the natives coming with, with buckets of gold, and they're pouring the gold at the feet of the encomendero. Okay, um, so if it was gold, if it's furs, if it's crops, whatever it was, you bring that to, you pay tribute to your encomendero, and he'll protect you. It's very much like the mafia. Uh, you know, you you pay protection, and you're protected. If you don't, you you'll be in trouble. So on the right, of course, they, they abuse these people. Well, there's nothing friendly about it, you know, and you, you have abuse of women uh, and men going on all the time, whipping, uh, you know, uh, awful. Uh, okay, so in the Americas, the first encomiendas were handed out by Christopher Columbus in the Caribbean uh, because it, for, for what his men did, a job well done. And the people he had conquered now had to serve him and give him tribute. Uh, so encomiendas were given to Spanish conquistadors, settlers, priests, or colonial officials, and the natives were forced to provide tribute of whatever whatever they had: gold, silver, crops, foodstuffs, pigs, llamas, whatever the land produced. They had to give to the encomendero. Uh, the natives could also be made to work for a certain amount of time. Many times they were sent to sugarcane plantations or in, into mines. But in return for the tribute, like I said, the owner or encomendero was responsible for the well-being of his subjects to see to that the natives were converted and educated about Christianity. So in short, this system allowed these men to receive labor and products from the vanquished. And in return, they would receive religious instruction and protection. So like I said before, kind of like paying off the mob, right? These prominent men became very wealthy from all the gold and silver that was in the in these areas, um, and and they mixed with the indigenous people. Mexico and northern South America became a mixed race society. The Spanish, Native Americans, and Africans mixed, and you have a the start of a mixed race society. Uh, mestizos were were a mix of Spanish and Native mulattoes. Now that's not really a word we use anymore. Um, uh, that's considered a derogatory uh, word, uh, much like perhaps Negro would be a derogatory word. Mulatto means a, a, a mule or an ass. So if you're calling somebody a mulatto, <clears throat> uh, you're calling them an ass. So we don't really use that word, but your book used it, so I'm using it just as a way to, to describe it. But I just want you to know that's not, I mean, I, I would say you hear that word, um, 
you know, still, but a, a better way to to, uh, to say it would be mixed race. Of course, all these examples are mixed race, but anyway, so mulatto would be Spanish and African, and, and zombos are Indian and African. So the the Spanish infused themselves into the indigenous uh, population of Mexico and and uh, and South America. Okay, so uh, you know Mexican people today are of mixed race because of the Spanish invasion and conquest that happened in the 1500s. Mm. So as we know that the Spanish wanted to convert people to Catholicism, forget your old ways, become Spanish. And the religious leaders were friars or padres. And so that's where the, the baseball team, uh, the San Diego Padres, get their name. Because, of course, San Diego Mission was here and they were, they were padres here. Uh, and we're going to learn more about, about this practice as it appeared in America and this idea that became known as Manifest Destiny and this process that became known as Americanization. We're going to talk more about that. What is manifest destiny? This is a this is an important term to understand because this this paints the entirety of the colonial era and the early um, you know hundred couple hundred years of America itself up until you know perhaps the end of the 19th century. So manifest destiny. <clears throat> it's the 19th century belief that the expansion of the United States throughout the American continents was both justified and inevitable. That's a belief that. That it, they have the right, the, the European people have the right to move across the land and make it their own. In fact, it was ordained by God because these white Christian people were his favorite. That's what they believe. We are God's chosen people. Okay. Uh, okay. So to, to properly set up the other two types of plantations, uh, I'm sorry, uh, colonies, plantation and neo-European, the two that were founded in what would become the United States. I I really got to give you some background first, and, and I know you're dying for some background information first, okay? So let's go back a little bit, go back to Europe and talk about Spain versus England. So this, these two countries down the road will compete for control of North America, <clears throat> and, and this will go on for a while. Uh, so in Europe, uh, <clears throat> uh, Spain fought with England over power, wealth, and religion. <clears throat> The, the Protestant faith became prop popular uh, in England, and this created conflicts between Catholics and Protestants. That, that still go on today. We still have a lot of, uh, in, in Ireland, not, uh, not that far back, you had huge issues with, with, with Catholics versus Protestants. <clears throat> so, of course, if, you know, uh, you're talking about, about uh, a, a established church and some people break away from it with a different point of view. So, so Europe, you know, it had really become a very confusing society. I mentioned that before. Bickering amongst each other over religion, power, <clears throat> and argued and fought over by leaders who were incompetent, in many cases cruel and selfish. They were, it was the bloodline. If, if, you're, if your father was the king and, and you were his oldest son, you were next. It didn't matter what kind of person you were, if you were qualified for the job, if you, you, you could be a, a, a lecherous, uh, you know, greedy, selfish person. It didn't matter. You became the king. So you have lots of issues going on in England because of lack of organized and determined leadership. Okay, so so what's the issue between Protestants and Catholics? Well, because Catholicism and Protestantism they're both denominations of Christianity, but but the Pope is at the head of the Catholic Church. Uh, you know, Protestantism is a general term that refers to Christianity that is not subject to papal authority. Papal meaning the Pope. So in the 16th century, you have what's called the Reformation, uh, the Protestant Reformation, or reforming the church, and people break away from the from the uh, the old Catholic ways. Uh, many faith groups split away from the Roman Catholic Church, and this and this destroyed the relative dominance of Catholicism in Western Europe that they had had throughout the Middle Ages. So throughout the Middle Ages, the the Catholic religion. The, uh, it was an oppressive religion that held people back and held people down and, and, and oppressed people. So please don't misunderstand me. I'm not criticizing the Catholic Church today, uh, and I'm not really criticizing it then. It, it's not the belief system that was the problem. It was the people that manipulated it and, and made it for their own gain. Okay. <clears throat> 
So the Protestant Reformation was a 16th century religious, political, intellectual, and cultural upheaval that splintered the Catholic, uh, Catholic Europe and setting in, in place the structures and beliefs that would define the continent in the modern era today. So it was an attempt to reform the Roman Catholic Church, and it resulted in the creation of Protestant churches. So Protestant means to protest. So if you're a Protestant, that means you're protesting the old Catholic Church. You're moving away from it. Uh, and you have these reformers, okay, in, in Northern and Central Europe, reformers like Martin Luther, uh, King Henry VIII, John Calvin, they challenged papal authority and questioned the Catholic, Catholic Church's ability to define Christian practice. Uh, so the Reformation ended the dominance imposed by medieval Christianity. And the eyes of many historians signal the beginning of the modern era. Uh, it was the end of the medieval stronghold that religion had had on people. It led to a lessening of the strictness and harshness of religions prior to it. So all these issues led to many conflicts between Protestant England and Catholic Spain. <clears throat> and their differences would result in a major war. Okay, So let's do a supplemental lecture right here. This is our second one. So we've done our first one. Don't forget what we're doing here. This is these. I'm going to give you a lecture that's outside of the chapter lecture. It's put together by me. So you're not going to find it on the internet. You, you can't copy and paste it as an answer later. Uh, how you do this is listen to what I'm saying, write down everything I say. I'm going to give you an introduction. I'm going to tell you about main points, and I'm going to give you relevance. And the assignment when your midterm comes, if this is a choice for you to write about, you simply review the lecture as given. You don't add information to it. You don't look for new stuff to add to it. You simply review what I've said in the lecture, okay? If you, if you have any questions about, about what a supplemental lecture is, please let me know. That's perfectly fine. Okay, here's our outline. Um, number one is background, or the same as introduction. Background introduction is the same thing. We'll talk about Philip and Elizabeth. We'll talk about Protestants versus Catholics. Number two is the, is the development of this issue. We'll talk about privateers. We'll talk about how the Spanish Armada was built. Number three is, is the battle. Uh, the Battle of the Spanish Armada. England's prepared. The Armada arrives. What significance do, does a hurricane and fire ships have in the defeat of the Spanish? So, so if you write, if you write about this, make sure you tell me about hurricanes and fire ships. Relevance of the lecture with this victory of the Spanish Armada. England gained confidence to venture across the Atlantic and become a player in the New World. And they would come to dominate American colonization, setting the stage for the birth of the United States of America. So why am I talking about European history in an in a American history class? Because this incident propelled England to become a world power, gave them confidence. They then ventured across the ocean to, to colonize. And of course, that's where the United States came from. Okay. Okay, let's get started. So King Philip II of Spain. Uh, ruled vast territories of land and had unparalleled wealth in the New World from plundering the Aztecs, Mayans, and Incans. On the other hand, at that time, England was a small country with little wealth, a few friends, and actually many enemies. But Queen Elizabeth was not afraid of Spain. Uh, Elizabeth believed completely in the devotion and loyalty of her people, and by believing in them, they believed in her. This is one of the one of the you know more famous popular women in history. Um, relations between Spain and England had actually started well. In fact, Philip II had actually proposed marriage to Elizabeth, but she declined. So their relations had since deteriorated over a period of thirty years. <clears throat> so England was a Protestant country. Uh, uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth was a Protestant, not a, not a Catholic. It didn't make make the Spanish happy because they were Catholic. Spain was a Roman Catholic country. So the Spanish had an open hostility towards this English queen. They believed she was illegitimate because she was a Protestant and had no right to the English throne. So they had been involved in plots to dethrone her. They want to reinstate Catholicism in England. Uh, so, of course, understand this is the era that the Spanish are plundering the New World, the Aztecs and the Incas. They're coming back with ships full of gold. And all of Europe's watching this. Another, another Spanish ship comes to harbor sunk down low in the water because they're full of gold. 
Everybody wants a piece of that. So, so Elizabeth decides that she's going to harass these Spanish ships, and she encourages the use of English privateers. So what's a privateer? People will say, well, it's a pirate. And, and you're right, but not, not entirely. A pirate roams the seas and raids anybody that he comes across. He's, he's got no loyalty. <clears throat> he's, he's just out for himself. A privateer is hired by a country to only raid the ships of, of a specific country. So it's still pirates, but they're working for a country. In this case, English privateers were hired to only harass and raid Spanish ships and, and get their uh, get their goods, okay? Uh, so these privateers raid Philip's ship as they made their way from the New World, seizing the plunder taken in Mexico, steal their riches, sink their ships, in general disrupt their systems. Uh, of course, this makes Philip very angry, so he determines to build a great armada or a big fleet, the Spanish Armada. 1585, he begins to build this great fleet. He's going to invade England. Uh, the purpose of the mission was to depose Elizabeth and defeat and conquer the English and make England Roman Catholic once again. Now, of course, Elizabeth had been aware of the intended invasion by England of England by some by Spain for some time. Uh, but she'd heard such rumors for almost 30 years, and in the past, she easily dismissed them. But this time it became clear to her, the Spanish are really going to come this time. They're sending this fleet against England. So she employed all her efforts in raising funds and, you know, uh, raising awareness of her people to ensure that when the Spanish fleet came, England would be prepared. So May of 1588, the, the Armada finally sets out. And the Spanish had a sound plan. They had a, over 100 ships, a very convincing force. And their plan was to come up from Spain. So you look at the map here. Uh, here's Spain. Uh, here's England. You're going you're gonna to sail up. And you're going to enter what's, what's called the English Channel here. And, and this is where you're going to battle whatever naval forces the English have. But you should defeat them pretty easily. Then you're going to land and and uh, advance on London and and conquer the country. Okay, that that's that's the plan. Uh, but you're also going to capture the heretic queen. Okay, so what is what is a heretic? A person holding an opinion that is at odds with what is generally accepted, especially in regards to religious doctrine. A heretic goes against religious doctrine. So of course a heretic. Is in in the in, in a Catholic's point of view or King Philip's point of view is a Protestant and she's a Protestant so she's a heretic so you, we're going to capture her and and remove her okay but as the fleet approaches England although you know uh, outmanned and outdone in every way they're prepared the the Queen got people prepared uh, on the cliffs of England and Wales, men watched the sea day and night, you know, waiting for the first glimpse of the Armada. And when they arrived, instead of sending messengers down to the city to say so, they lit these, these great beacons on the side of the hill, these great lights. And the people of, of London and, and wherever could see them, okay? So when the lights were lit, it meant the Spanish are here. Uh, so... By that morning, London and the Queen knew that the day of the invasion had come. And as soon as the ships began to make their way up, the Spanish ships began to make their way up the English Channel, the fighting began. Uh, so while, while English soldiers and sailors fought for England, Queen Elizabeth made her way to the battlefield and gave a very inspiring speech at Tilbury, England. So she had determined she's not going to hide inside a guarded palace like most monarchs would while her people fought. She was going to live or die with them. And so she rode into Tilbury on a white horse, inspected her soldiers. So Tilbury is just east of London on the coast. So if, if the Spanish were successful in defeating the Navy, they would land at Tilbury, defeat that, and then move on to London. Uh, so she gathers her, her, her people, her troops together and, and gave a very inspiring speech, probably, probably her most famous speech. And this is an excerpt from it. My loving people, we have been persuaded by some that are careful of our safety to take heed how we commit ourselves to armed multitudes for fear of treachery. Let tyrants fear. I have also, I have always so behaved myself that under God, 
I have placed my chief strength and safeguard in the loyal hearts and goodwill of my subjects. And therefore, I come amongst you all, as you see at this time, not for my recreation and disport, but being resolved in the midst and heat of the battle to live or die amongst you all, to lay down for my God, my Protestant God, for my kingdom and for my people, my honor, my blood, even in the dust. I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, Elizabeth, please, but I have this heart and stomach of a king and a king of England too. And think foul scorn that Parma or Spain or any prince of Europe should dare to invade the borders of my realm. There's those brackets again. So when, when she says Parma, in those days that they knew what that meant, but we don't. So I, I clarify it for you by putting in brackets what she meant. So when she says Parma, she's referring to the Duke of Parma of the Netherlands, okay? So what she actually said was, and think foul scorn that Parma or Spain or any prince of Europe should dare to invade the borders of my realm. Okay, so this is a very impactful speech, but per perhaps not not entirely in the in the uh, spirit of women's rights with the body of a weak and feeble woman. I think she was being a little dramatic there because she was hardly hardly uh, weak and feeble. Uh, but very very impactful speech, very famous uh, in history. But while this is going on, the battle in the in the channel is going on, and amazingly, the Spanish were not doing so well. The weather had turned very bad very suddenly with wind and rain working against them. Of course, the English can simply come home and 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 you know. Um, uh, Dock at, at the on the coastline. The Spanish are hundreds of miles from home. Where, where, where are they going to go? So they're they're stuck out there. This storm that came up, um, storm today, I believe it was probably a hurricane. And they had no way to really measure those things in those days. But looking at the damage done, it's unusual for a hurricane to happen in England. But this is probably what happened. Uh, so a hurricane created absolute chaos for the Armada. Uh, and by the time it was over, they were in absolute disarray. Many ships had sunk, many of their rigging was gone, they were stuck, they were rudderless, they were sitting ducks. So the English then sent out fire ships. So a fire ship is taking an old derelict ship that you don't care about, all these ships were wooden, and you set the steering so it goes a certain direction, you light it on fire. So of course it's gonna go up in flames very quickly. The, the Spanish ships are, are are stuck there. They can't move. So the fire ships would point at them, and when they would come out and hit the Spanish ships, it would it would cause the Spanish ship to, to be caught on fire. So the combination of the hurricane and the fire ships, uh, you know, the, the results were disastrous for the Spanish, and uh, the Armada was defeated. This is a shock heard around the world. How could the English defeat this mighty Armada? Uh, you know, um, so so all these disadvantages went against the Spanish effort. They were unsuccessful with their invasion. And they were soundly defeated by the English, and they were forced to retreat. But but now they 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 can't come back sh the short way because the English are, are ready for them. So they have to go all the way around the the entire United Kingdom. You're talking about men that were you know, uh, wounded and, and ships that were limping along. This took a long time and many people died. So the Spanish are, are absolutely, you know, shocked and embarrassed. Uh, so the battle's over. England had won. England is jubilant with the victory. No longer considered a second-rate power. They had just conquered the mighty fleet of the Spanish Empire. And they started to strike medals uh, for people to, to wear. And on the medals, it said, God blew, and they were scattered. Uh, so it was believed that the storm, the hurricane that had appeared, it was no ordinary storm. Um, it was the work of a Protestant God. The, the hurricane that came proved that, that God endorsed his Protestant people, not the Catholics. So the queen participated fully in the celebrations. God bless you, my people, she called out, and they heaped blessings on her. Uh, the defeat of the Spanish Armada by England is legendary in English history, as well as world history. Uh, this is one of those, you know, um, uh, David and Goliath moments. But, but more importantly, it signaled a shift in power amongst European nations. 
The defeat of the Spanish Armada is one of the most famous events in English history, most certainly Queen Elizabeth's finest hour. Uh, she she had been called the savior of the English people. Now it seemed that that is what she really had become. Uh, she led her people to, to glory, defeating Spain, the greatest power in the 16th century world. So so why am I talking about European history? What's it, what does this have to do with, with American history? Uh, well, this this victory, um, it, it led it led to England becoming a world power. The defeat of the Spanish Armada catapulted England onto the world stage. And it marks the rise of England as a world power. And it's at some point they would become the world power. It starts with this victory. But what's important about the United States or American history is that the the English gained confidence from from this uh, victory to venture across the Atlantic and become a player in the new world. They had stayed out of it until then, uh, and they would come to dominate English colonization and dominate the the new world. And here is the original thirteen colonies. Of course, this set this is this sets the stage for the birth of the United States of America. <clears throat> okay, so the relevance of the election to to wrap it up with this victory over the Spanish Armada, England gained confidence to venture across the Atlantic and become a player in the New World, and they would come to dominate American colonization, setting the stage for the birth of the United States of America. Okay. Okay, that is the end of that supplemental lecture. Okay, so moving on, let's talk about about so, so let's let's go back to our colonies. So plantation colonies. Uh, I mentioned the lecture in chapter one, Sao Tome, uh, off the coast of Africa, was the first experiment uh, in in plantations and became the model for everybody to follow. And everybody in that came to the New World, where the United States uh, South, the Caribbean. Central America, uh, South America, they followed this model that was established on Sao Tome. Uh, and so, you know, Sao, Sao Tome started established sugar plantations with the help of slaves in the mainland and set the tone for the, for the later profitable plantation uh, system that would come to the New World. But this is where the idea of plantation colonies come from. Sao Tome's success inspired others to replicate what they had done. <clears throat> So the the definition of colonization said that you take advantage of the indigenous people that that were there as as your as your labor force. So if that's the case, then why weren't the Native Americans the slaves for, for the Europeans when they came? Why did they bring Africans with them? Well, the truth is there just wasn't enough of them. Why? Because European diseases had decimated them. There wasn't enough left. Ninety percent of the native population died. They, there wasn't enough to to choose from, so they chose Africans to be their labor force. So it must be nice to choose a race that will be your your free labor source against their will, of course. But you 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 know inflict that upon them, okay? So it's it's kind of ironic. On the one hand, the European diseases had little to do with Africans becoming slaves, but on the other hand, African slavery was a direct result of it. So as I mentioned, England had been slow getting started in the New World. Uh, they hadn't been a player on the international stage. Uh, many other countries were getting rich from the New World, uh, specifically Spain, of course, but initially England had had some failure. So England's first attempt to colonize the New World was at Roanoke, Roanoke uh, would be the first English settlement in the New World. Uh, so this was founded by the English explorer Sir Walter Raleigh in August of 1585, and this this colony was in, was in existence for five years, 1585, 1595, six years. But but history knows it as the Lost Colony of Roanoke. So so why do they call it that? Well, the first colonists that went there did not fare very well. They were suffering from dwindling food supplies and Indian attacks. So in 1586, they returned to England aboard a ship captained by Sir Francis Drake uh, of Spanish Armada fame. Uh, but uh, a couple of, the, the following year, a man named John White, I'm sorry, well, John White was sent by Sir Walter Raleigh to go back and try again. 
So, uh, so white sent by Raleigh comes with a hundred colonists to come back to the Roanoke Island and start over. So, so Roanoke, Roanoke Island is not Roanoke, Virginia. Roanoke Island is an island in um, North Carolina, present day North Carolina. Okay. Okay. So once he got his his colonists set up and established at Roanoke, he then White then went back to England to procure more supplies. So understand it. It could take you two three months to cross the ocean. So going to get get supplies is not like going to Costco. You come back in an hour. You you got to cross the the ocean maybe three months it might take you two weeks a month to get supplies then you got to cross back so you, you're going to be gone for five seven eight months so that they understand the people knew it's going to be a long time before these supplies get back here but when white returns to england to get more supplies the spanish armada battle is going on uh so this delayed his return to roanoke he, he couldn't leave right away when he finally returned to England, it was in August of 1590. So nearly three years had gone by and these people had not been supplied. So when he gets there, he comes up to the colony and he finds it's deserted, There's nobody there. Uh, where are the people? Everyone had vanished. There was nobody there. The colony was there, the buildings were there, the tools and belongings were there, but they weren't there. No people, no trace of the hundred or so colonies white left behind. No, so, no sign of violence, nothing was burnt, nothing, there weren't bodies everywhere, no sign of, of some kind of epidemic disease, there weren't bodies, there was nothing there, no, no bodies. Uh, the only clue that they found was very mysterious carving in one of the palisades of, of, the, uh, of the colony. So a palisade is a fence of wooden stakes or, or iron railings that were fixed in the ground. You, you've seen the the typical fort that's that's you know the the the, the wall is a is trees with the point, with points at the top that's a palisade. But somebody uh, carved crow towing in one of the palisades. That's the only clue that they had. Uh, <clears throat> so White took this to mean that the colonists had moved to Crow Towan Island 50 miles away. Not sure why they would do that, but okay, they must have gone there. So they went to Croatoan Island. There was nobody there. So literally to this day, nobody knows. This is one of those mysteries of American history. Nobody knows what happened to these people. They were simply vanished. Okay. Um, okay. So so it doesn't it doesn't work out so well. Uh, England's first attempts at colonization does not work out so well. Uh, so um, you know they 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 are not. Not not that excited about it. <clears throat> so 1590, uh, they they wait 17 years <clears throat> to try it again, and they start Jamestown. This will be the first permanent English colony, and <clears throat> the first, of course, successful. So 17 years later, uh, <clears throat> the people of Jamestown they they didn't come to <clears throat> um, they they came for wealth, and and these are the people that thought they could find look at the gold on the ground because they saw the Spanish. It must be easy in the new world. Of course, they didn't find that. So they weren't prepared to plant, to get sheltered, to plant crops in the summer. <clears throat> and they, they do very, very power, uh, uh, poorly. Okay. Uh, and this, of course, is where this idea of the Native Americans helping them, showing them you know, what they should be doing and how to grow crops. This idea of Thanksgiving uh, is born. It's, it's probably more of a myth than, than, than what we give it today. Uh, but, but without question, the Native Americans helped the, the people at Jamestown survive because they were just hanging by a thread and almost throwing in the towel coming back. What saved them? Well, actually, they found a crop that did very well, tobacco. So tobacco saved the day. So you could, you could argue that the the cornerstone of American uh, success is cigarettes in, in school because tobacco and cigars, tobacco saved them. They found a cash crop and suddenly everybody in the world wanted new world tobacco. People started growing tobacco everywhere and uh, tobacco, you know, became popular. It, it, it resulted in Jamestown getting much bigger and everyone's growing tobacco. So they're the, the lands covered with these with these uh, with this crop, of course that puts pressure on the natives, makes them angry, will lead to conflicts down the road. Tobacco took a lot of land, 
and the Europeans pushed the, the natives out to do it. It was easy to do because they were dying from disease. They didn't have much defense. Uh, but Jamestown grows, uh, House of Burgesses was formed. So this, so Jamestown is truly the first <clears throat> American attempt at government, although England controlled it. And then more people came and, and the population swelled to 4,500. But again, at the expense of native lands, this would spark a 10 year conflict with Native Americans. Uh, the English established the Anglican church at Jamestown. People had to pay taxes to the church, okay? The other colony uh, formed in 1634 was by Lord Baltimore, was the county of Maryland. This became a Catholic county colony, sorry. Uh, so here you go again, you've, you've got the same issue going on, different, different sects of Christianity fighting with each other. Uh, but the truth is, even even though uh, England was mostly mostly Protestant, there still were many English that were Catholics. So the result is kind of what would become America. It's not a, it's you're you're 130 years away from from the United States, but the idea of toleration is born in America in the New World. What would become the United States? This was not happening in Europe. It was oppressive. So the Toleration Act supported Catholics in Maryland, guaranteed toleration to all Christians, death was upon those who, did, who denied Jesus. So they got a little bit, of that, a little bit of that European angst still in there. But the toleration acts allowed Catholics to follow their beliefs and establish churches um, without any kind of harassment. Uh, so this is the precursor to freedom of religion, allowing all types of worship, not establishing a state church, the state church that tells you that you have to worship this or this, this, uh, this faith or else, okay? Another source of labor for the New World, and, and, and initially before, before the Africans came, were brought here, uh, was indentured servants. So this is typically white European men, in some cases women. So an indentured servant would, would be a, you know, a person that wants to come to the New World but doesn't have the means to get here. You know, they're poor people. Uh, so they would agree to work for a, a, a specific person for four or five years without pay, just room and board. And in return, they would get free passage as well as room and board. So they, 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 they come across from Europe and they, they get here for free. They're, 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 they get room and board for four or five years. And then at the end of the contract, they could marry. They weren't allowed to marry when they were indentured. Uh, at the at the end of their indenture, they would usually receive land from the landowner who, who paid your passage. Not always the best land, but it's something to start. Okay, uh, seventy five percent of indentured servants were men, twenty five percent were women, usually white. Uh, some were abused and mistreated. This wasn't this wasn't a nice uh, situation. Always these people were also abused and oppressed, especially women. Uh, so why why they go from indentured European servants to African slaves? Well, a drop in tobacco prices resulted because everybody was grown. It was everywhere. And what happens when you have a you know when you have a, an abundance of a product, the price drops, supply and demand. You know the price goes down when you have a whole lot of it. The price goes up when you don't have that much of it. Same thing if people want it, prices go up or down. So the prices drop, and uh, one, so that this this of course resulted in planters going to slavery. We've seen that it was more profitable just to buy somebody one time. You don't have to pay their their fare over here. You buy you buy them, you put them in a shack instead of you know a a, a more uh, you know um, an indentured servant wouldn't wouldn't always live inside of a big house but live better than in a shack. These are slaves. These are inferior uh, beings. Put them in shacks and and don't feed them very well. So it was much less to, to have a slave than an indentured, ser an indentured servant. Uh, so this is, of course, the, the era where skin color became an identifying factor as to your social status. This is a new feature regarding slavery. Skin color was never an identifying factor about slavery before the Americas. This idea starts in the Americas. So slavery throughout the history of human beings has always been there, but you were a prisoner of war, you were you were captured, you were a debtor, you were a criminal, and you'd be a slave. And you you might be worked to death and abused and, and oppressed, don't get me wrong, it was never pretty, 
But at some point, you had the idea that you would be free. Uh, it wasn't until the, the New World, where slavery became about the color of your skin. If you were black, you were slave for life. And so were your children. You, you had you had no chance of ever getting getting out of it. It, it, it was your lot in life. Okay. Okay. Um, the the third uh, type of colony is neo Europeans. This is like where you're replicating what where you came from in Europe. So so here you see the the Dutch wind uh, windmills in in Europe, and they bring them to, to New Amsterdam, what what would become New York City. Uh, they want to reproduce the exact society that they were accustomed to in Europe. I mean, it makes sense, familiarity. So New England, New York, New Amsterdam, New France, New Netherlands uh, were all named after cities and countries back in Europe. They copied the, the social and economic systems that they were used to. Okay. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. We will pick up, uh, this is this is the end of part one of chapter two. We will pick up neo-European colonies in the second part of chapter two. Thank you.